Welcome all, my name is John Bird, and I'm representing the Strategic Studies Department here at Joint Special Operations University. Today we are pleased to present a distinguished speaker including audience Q&A. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAL network. Please keep in mind that the views and the opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. Good morning, Maria Marukian, and to our audience. Thank you all for agreeing to join us for this fascinating discussion about the power of inclusion. As many of the audience members know, I am Dr. Joe Long, a retired Green Beret and faculty member here at the Joint Special Operations University, where we remain collectively interested in uncovering and refining the capabilities of the soft profession that add strategic value to the national defense in shaping America's relational edge in strategic competition. In recent months, we've spoken a great deal about the special operator's ability to shape strategic competition by influencing micro-level partner forces in developing countries and often tribal societies in places where representatives of the American government remain in direct competition with our adversaries in political, political spaces that are exceedingly complex and hazardous and where traditional military presence is difficult to sustain. As a person who volunteered to have the privilege of interviewing you today, I am highly interested in learning more about the power of inclusion and your perspectives that will certainly shape how the soft profession understands partner force leadership and how we can better lead even when we're not in charge. And likewise, how we have the information necessary to shape the future of the soft profession in terms of who we take on, who we onboard, how we lead, and how we manage ourselves. So we are grateful for your willingness to talk to us about your work. As we begin, for those who are not familiar, Maria Marukian is the president and founder of MSM Global Consulting and is a podcast host who explores issues related to sustainable inclusion, stereotypes, and emotional ownership. She has a highly rated TEDx talk on sustainable inclusion. So, Maria, to set the stage for today's conversation, could you please tell us a little bit about your professional background and how you found yourself committed to understanding diversity and inclusion? Sure, thank you, Dr. Long, and thank you all so much for uh, welcoming, welcoming me today. I'm really excited to be here. I, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a professional and a personal bend to this work. I, uh, I started um, my, my career in uh, leadership development, organizational culture change um, with a specific lens on intercultural communication, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think part of the reason um, that I was so interested in this was, you know, professionally, academically, I've just always been interested in sort of the human side of how systems work, how individuals bring their um, very multifaceted identities and perspectives and beliefs with them into the workplace and don't necessarily realize how they're driving the way that we uh, the way that we behave and the way that we interpret other people's behavior. So that's just always been really fascinating to me to look um, at our interaction, interactions and communications through this lens of our identity. And then I also think from a personal vantage point, I grew up in a multicultural family. My, uh, my father's side of the family were refugees twice over. Uh, they uh, had to flee Turkey back in the um, 1920s and landed in Cuba. My father was actually born and raised in Cuba and then came to the United States as a young man. So um, even though I had this very sort of uh, Midwestern upbringing in the suburbs of Detroit, Michigan, uh, growing up as a white Catholic, you know, middle-class um, family, there was always this undercurrent of difference and this value that was deeply embedded in my family around standing up for those whose voices are often silenced. Um, so I think that's really sort of been a, a core thread to my work as I, as I have engaged in training, development, coaching um, with organizations. I've had the opportunity to work in the government. As I was with the State Department for several years as a leadership development practitioner, as well as the um, Office of Personnel Management's Federal Executive Institute. So I've had a chance to meet a lot of leaders from a lot of different agencies. And I think that although all of our organizations are unique, 
um, and have their own very specific cultures, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the challenges that leaders at all levels face when it comes to um, creating a space where people can bring their full selves to work, can be valued for everything that they are. Wow, thank you very much for those introductory comments. And that will certainly help us set the stage and heat up the room as our JSAL president is fond of saying. As our conversation unfolds today and as a leadership scholar, I have no doubt that we, we will all come to understand the realities of diversity and in the modern world um, and perhaps explore some ways together for the soft profession to better understand, appreciate and incorporate these lessons and astute observations into our professional way of thinking. Without too much attention being paid to the clock, I anticipate we will have conversation for about 45 minutes and then offer our audience the chance to enhance our narratives by asking their own questions. So for those of you in the audience, this interview is for you. We welcome all listeners to ask questions and help us all explore this idea to the fullest degree possible. So please feel free to use the chat box to input questions and my JSAL teammates will help us include these questions into the dialogue. So one question that's on everybody's mind, no doubt, is about the specifics of sustainable inclusion. What is it and how did this concept develop? So this idea of sustainability, I think is so important. And you know, the research really um, has borne out over the last couple of decades. You know, first and foremost, I mean, diversity, inclusion, equity work is not new, right? We've been, uh, we've been sort of working at this, tracking it for a number of decades, and it just keeps evolving in terms of how it shows up. One of the challenges that um, have been highlighted in really the last 20 years, I would say, is that um, one-off diversity training, uh, where we, we sort of check the box and say, okay, we did it, we talked about it, are we good now, is not going to lead to systemic change. Um, in fact, sometimes the research shows that that can actually backfire, especially if the way that the, um, the concepts are presented are in a way that feels divisive, feels as though people are either being attacked for aspects of their identity that they don't have control over or are not given the proper tools to, you know, actually engage in some behavior change. So they're left saying, what am I supposed to do with this now that I know it? Um, what we have seen, there are practices that have led to sustainable change. And um, I think overall, what it, what it really boils down to is seeing diversity and inclusion as a core component of organizational culture and organizational success. And so that means that we have to be looking at and having honest conversations about um, the existing structure the existing population and workforce. And a lot of times organizations will say, and I've heard this from a, a lot of federal agencies as well, we have diversity um, in our workforce. And the question is always, where does that diversity exist in terms of racial ethnic makeup, in terms of age diversity, gender diversity, um, LGBTQIA? Uh, and so if it's concentrated in sort of the, um, the individual contributor levels of the organization, but you don't see um, a, an equitable representation at all levels or within all job functions, then that's probably an area that you want to, um, you want to tag as some work to be done. It's also a lot of times organizations will focus on representation and not focus on the organizational culture. And then what you have is we bring in a lot of people who are from these underrepresented, traditionally underrepresented groups, but they don't feel like they are understood, that their, um, their needs are being met. They sometimes feel as though they're being sidelined because the organizational culture has not been cultivated uh, to be inclusive for them. And I don't think that that's necessarily the quote unquote fault of anyone who's a part of the culture is that that's that's the core piece right and, and a sustainable inclusive culture is one in which everybody, um, regardless of who they are, is able to participate fully in organizational life. Um, so that's the work that I think a lot of DEI practitioners have been really focusing on in the last few years is let's make these efforts sustainable over time, which means we have to set strategic goals 
um, that focus not only on representation, but also the way we function, the way we communicate, the way we interact, um, that call attention to some of those unconscious blind spots that have just existed in the organizational culture, um, the way we've always done things, right? And who does the way we've always done things serves typically the people who have been the most represented. So it can be challenging. And I think we'll probably talk about this too, Dr. Malong, is it can be painful, right? We're talking about um, really having some uncomfortable and challenging conversations and not everyone necessarily is coming to these conversations with the same level of um, comfort and interest and uh, enthusiasm. So I think that's part of the work too, is that change in any way, shape or form can be challenging and difficult. And so how do we make it a little bit less painful for the folks um, who really need to get um, to, to get on board with this? I, I like a lot of the things you said there and going back to one of your first comments, um, when you talked about one-off training and how one-off training it tends to be in, insufficient, um, it made me think about some of the interesting conversations we've had recently with um, frankly, a similar topic, which is, which is ethics, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the things that we're also learning is that one-off or, or entry-level ethics, you know, going through a bunch of ethical training at the beginning of one's career doesn't set that person up for a lifetime of ethical thinking. And in the same way that one-off diversity training doesn't set you up for a lifetime of being able to think differently about diversity as well as inclusion. So I think it's important that we realize that when we're changing, if we're going to change the way people think, it requires obviously beginning training that's necessary but not sufficient we have to continue to add it and these are the opportunities we have as we progress through our career and as we build and shape the soft professional culture and the soft professional ethos we can think about how to instill meaning you know in a meaningful way the, the, these type of thinkings so i really appreciate that i'm also thinking about you know since we are at the joint special operations university oriented to thinking about the the soft profession um, there's a pragmatic sense that a lot of people have inside the profession that tends to drive how our culture developed, right? Right or wrong, good or bad, the, the soft culture developed for a particular reason. So I think we'll have a great opportunity to talk about how the culture developed. And then we can start thinking about ways that uh, the things we're talking about today can help shape that and help solve some of the, some of the frictions that, that we'll uncover, no doubt, as we continue talking. Um, and a lot of that, you know, it's, it's based on the idea of the pragmatic need for special operators to survive and thrive in, in complex, hazardous combat, you know, situations. So as we're doing that, um, I wanted us to think about soft professionals in, in the, the way that the soft profession is rooted in small teams, right? So the center of gravity of the soft profession are these, these special operator teams that come from across the joint world and they operate in a, in, in a specialized manner in highly complex hazardous conditions, typically in cross-cultural areas that are, that are very peculiar and, and much different from you know, where we live at home. So my question is, uh, what impact will diversity and inclusion have on improving soft teams? Because if we can tie it to this is good for the team, then we can, we can really, really continue with, with our conversation in a meaningful way for, for the rest of the audience and for those who will listen later. So how, how will we have an impact on, on the teams and how will we be able to truly uh, deliver that sustainable diversity as, as we move across our organizations? Yeah, I love that word pragmatic that you mentioned because I think that's really at the crux of this. A lot of times there is um, sort of this, to a certain extent, misinterpretation that diversity and inclusion work is just about you know, being nice and touchy feely. And, uh, you know, I think that there is an absolute um, benefit and value to exploring the fact that when we focus on diversity and inclusion, we make people feel better um, about who they are. We make them feel included and they are then more likely to be engaged. Uh, they're, you know, uh, they are more likely to feel a sense of comfort and confidence. Um, in addition to that, though, the pragmatic piece is that the more that I have exposure to different identity groups, to different perspectives, to different mental models, to different cultural communication nuances, the more highly skilled I become 
in being able to interact and accommodate those different nuances. So there's a lot of research that shows just, you know, from a, from a DEI perspective, from a diversity, equity, inclusion perspective, that the more exposure we have to people from different perspectives who are sharing those perspectives with us, um, when we're opened up to that, the, you know, we're changing sort of the, the um, neurocircuitry in our brains, we're actually becoming more adept at being able to code switch. Um, being able to communicate more effectively across those differences, being able to make better and more strategic decisions about how to communicate, how to respond. Um, so I think from that perspective, it's very pragmatic. Also from the perspective of team building, um, considering the fact that trust is such an underpinning element of these teams' success. Um, when we feel a sense of trust, when I feel like I am fully valued, when I feel like I have what we call psychological safety, right? The, the safety to be able to share my perspectives, my opinions, my um, identity fully with my team and know that they are going to, um, they're going to value me. There, there will not be judgment um, or repercussions or any sort of punishment late placed upon me, um, then that trust is not only built and fortified, but it means that I'm going to be more likely to raise my voice if I have concerns, um, if I have to give somebody feedback, um, if, I have to, uh, if I have to raise the flag that something is really critically wrong. Um, and there is uh, research that I've seen, actually, I think this came from, uh, there was a study done I think it was with the Navy, but I can't recall right now, um, where they, they asked, they surveyed um, uh, officers and asked them um, how likely would they be to um, feel safe uh, expressing any sort of concerns around discrimination or harassment. And then and they found that the numbers um, were uh, of discomfort were significantly higher for African Americans and Asians in this particular study. So I think it just, you know, that pinpoints the fact that if I don't feel trust to be able to share when I feel like I have been treated in a disparate way, that's really problematic, right? So um, I think being able to focus on diversity and inclusion helps us to build trusting, thriving teams. The third aspect that I think is really important that you mentioned was the fact that you're you are interacting constantly with incredibly culturally diverse groups in settings that are completely and totally different than what we're accustomed to from this sort of Western, you know, US centric mindset. And so again, the more that we can bring this level of skill of not only, okay, I understand that people from this culture think this way and we think this way, but it's more so how am I reflecting on my own emotional reaction to the way that people are showing up, if I can pay attention to that and manage myself more effectively in those cross-cultural settings um, and know how to uh, engage with people in an open-minded and respectable way, the better results I'm going to get in those, those interactions. So I know that was a lot, but I think that that, that um, question is such a profound one. No, I appreciate that answer. And I don't think that there's too much you can say about, about trust. And one of the things that I've observed personally as, in a, in, as a person in the special operations world for a while is we have a lot of mechanisms by which we can build trust inside a team. And we do pretty well with that because we spend a lot of times doing very, very dangerous things together. And we get used to operating in that where, where you know, bullets are flying by, by your head and, and, and we work on that. The problem is, how do we include other people when we deploy to other areas, right? So that's that's us training here. But when we go to work, right, we're, when, when we're actually doing our job, we're in other places. And I think that's where people might realize, oh, that's what he's talking about. How do we include people that we're working with, that we're trying to lead in these, you know, very, very interesting cross-cultural peculiar environments? Um, and I think it's very interesting when you start thinking about the, the relationship between trust and identity. And so one of the things that I've spent a little bit of time researching is kind of that relationship and how, how trying to shape a new identity that's inclusive has, has some, some success. You know, it's, it's, it's correlated with success in achieving an overall like 
view of, of, of unity and trust. So I think it's important that that you're recognizing and echoing some of the other research out there that's saying that, hey, trust is trust is everything. And the more people that you have from different backgrounds, the easier it is for people to understand, to overcome that inertia or to, to overcome the frictions really to get some inertia into thinking about trust. So I really appreciate it. Um, and continuing with our theme of, of like the pragmatic aspects of it, because I think in a lot of ways it just relates to people. They're like, if this makes us better, then we'll do it. And, and that's not just with this, but with anything, right? If it makes us better, we'll do it. Um, so I'm thinking of about, you know, recent interview, and we talked a little bit about this when we first met. Um, Dartmouth professor uh, Jason Lyle came and he spoke with us about his book, Divided Armies. And in there, he has some pretty fascinating, um, fascinating empirical research where he finds that more diverse militaries tended to be more successful in battle. And this is going back from like the 1800s until now. And so as we start thinking that oh, maybe, maybe I don't want to spend time doing diversity training because it takes away from our ability to work on something more important, whether it's mastering lethality or, or, or maneuver or, you know, jumping out of airplanes, you know, some other skill that might be more important. Well, once you recognize that the, the math essentially shows that more diverse armies that adds, you know, do better, that adds to that pragmatic aspect. So I think it's great that we're able to talk about it. Um, so then, so that said, right, given that we understand that and research tends to show that there's a lot of support for the ideas that we're talking about, why do you think a lot of organizations, and you know, and we can even say like some organizations within the special operations world, why do you think some organizations are slow to recognize this and adapt to, to kind of embrace university? <laughs> um, I think because it does require a pretty deep amount of um, examination of the status quo with an intention to change it. And, uh, and that's hard, right? Um, especially when you've got organizations that, you know, typically, again, especially, um, you know, in military, you have very deep seated cultures with long traditions. Um, and that is so um, entrenched in the messaging that people receive from day one um, all the way through their careers. And it's not to say that that messaging is wrong. It's just, um, it's, it really requires a great amount of intentionality and time, quite frankly, because culture does not change overnight. It takes years to really kind of um, shift those core beliefs of who we are and how we operate. And so I think that's what often gets in the way is that just, you know, the momentum dies. Um, I think one of the other challenges that we often face, two more challenges, one is um, a lot of times what we see is stops and starts and stops and starts when it comes to DEI work. And I think part of that is because you don't have a consistent structure in place with uh, con con continuity and sustainable leadership, right? So it can't just fall on the shoulders of one person who becomes sort of the, the missionary for diversity and inclusion and goes out and proselytizes but then when they get burned out or leave, the, the effort dies with them, right? It's more so about ensuring that there is an internal structure in place with really solid goals and strategies that are meaningful to everybody within the workforce. I think the third thing that's incredibly crucial and a lot of organizations, including federal agencies are, are focusing on this more intentionally now is accountability. And that starts with leadership. It has to be a top-down approach um, and there needs to be a clear measurable uh, performance element to this so that leaders are holding themselves and others accountable uh, for not only um, meeting certain diversity uh, strategies or goals, but also continuously fostering an inclusive environment. Being willing to put themselves out there first to share their stories to explore what they don't know um, and to make it a common part of the language. I think that's a really critical piece that um, will make or break a sustainable initiative. I like what you said about the, the common language because that obviously goes a long way. Um, do you think that organizations still, despite all of this research, tend to hold on to the belief that a sense of homogeneity is the mark of a successful organization? And I say that because I think a good amount of identity can overcome that, but outside, when you don't understand identity, then you just notice homogeneity, right? 
And then homogeneity makes people feel safe. And so that could be a possible, you know, friction point that keeps people from overcoming that. And if that's the case, how do you think we can frame this in a way that has, you know, a meaningful effect? Well, yes, absolutely. And I think that that happens both explicitly and implicitly, mm -hmm. right? So there are some organizations that do, you know, if leaders are holding on to this idea that more of the same equals better results, it's really not about better results. It's um, uh, known results, right? This is what we've had thus far. This is what's worked for us. We're not going to mess with it. Disruption um, to the status quo is, uh, is too risky or too threatening. Um, and so I think sometimes that happens explicitly. The other way it sometimes shows up is, of course, we welcome diversity and we value it, but um, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, subjugate or compromise quality um, in, for the sake of diversity. And I think that that argument is a false narrative, but that can sometimes um, be presented as a way to hold on to the existing uh, structure. And then implicitly, I mean, it's just, this is human nature. All of us uh, just as human beings are, you know, are hardwired to gravitate toward people who are like us in some way, look like us, think like us, talk like us. And so that drives our decisions. It, it frames our, our social networks and who we perceive as credible, who we tend to trust, who we tend to look for when we're hiring, what um, skill sets, what communication, uh, you know, um, uh, norms tend to feel more comfortable or quote unquote better to us because that's what we're accustomed to. And so we then end up hiring more of ourselves. We end up promoting more of ourselves. Um, and whether that is based on race or ethnicity or gender or age, we all do it. Um, I'm a, you know, I've been doing this work for 18 years now and I still have to pull myself back sometimes from making decisions that are you know, kind of sustaining more of the same of what I already have um, within my own organization, within my own sort of teams that I build. So I think it's just something that requires us to acknowledge that we all tend to do that, that we, regardless of what we, what we think consciously, unconsciously, that software is running in the back of our mind and it's driving our decisions, we intuitively are looking for more of us. So I hope that answers your question, but I think that it really is, um, you know, where organizations, I think, are starting to realize how important this is, it's that it's not necessarily always the explicit, but it's more the implicit, um, that we have to pull that to the conscious level and, uh, and say, how do we become more intentional about seeking people and experiences and perspectives that are not um, the same that we've always had? I think those are great points, and I appreciate that. I like how you were talking about human nature, and we find ourselves thinking about that quite a bit. And I think sometimes there's a little bit of a false belief that because something is human nature, that it's okay, right? So, you know, you think about human nature. If somebody attacks you, you know, it's human nature to, like, curl up in a ball and protect yourself. That's not the best way to fight. If you push someone out of an airplane, human nature to flail around to try to find something to grab on, but that's not the best way to control yourself when you're parachuting. So mm -hmm. a lot of military training is designed to overcome the negative parts of human nature. And so I think sometimes maybe that comparison will help people realize, ah, just because I, you know, cause I'll say, I'll say, Hey, well, it's human nature. And it's like, it's okay. I don't have to change. Cause I'm just, I'm just being a human, but like everything else, it's that part of human nature that we do have to change. We do have to shape it and we do have to move forward. So I think you, you really helped bring out that that point and that just because it's human nature doesn't mean we don't we don't still have work to do. And I also really like the quality argument. And I think this goes back to the pragmatic aspects of what we were talking about before. And I find that a lot of times the quality argument, anytime you have these things, is the first thing gets thrown up and it's like, rip, here's a wall that we're not going to be able to overcome. And when we start talking about quality and it's like, look, the training pipeline exists no matter who shows up. The pipeline is already there. Whatever your pipeline is to become a special operator is already there and it's running. All we're doing is saying that someone else is going to get a chance to go over it. But the, so I find the quality argument makes for a, a very interesting distraction from us trying to understand that, hey, we're not saying anything other than we're going to let other people try. 
But one of the interesting things, going back a little bit, that I wanted to ask a, a little bit more about, and and you know, putting on your consultant hat, and maybe you can help teach us all something here, specifically, we talk about a top-down approach, and I like that, and I agree that there needs to be top-down support. But special operations is an interesting culture, and it's very bottom-up oriented, right? So it's it's very centered around the the soft team and these highly selected soft professionals that have a lot of agency in the organization. And so because of that, how do you think we can manage or, or balance really the, the, the emphasis from, on something important like this from top down with the need for there really to be, there really needs to be a lot of buy-in from the bottom up because the culture is, takes place on a team when no one else is around. And that's a big part of like to change the culture, you can't have somebody telling you, hey, change. It's got to come from within and really, really make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a both and, right? It's top down. It's yeah. also, it is that grassroots. Um, and, and to that end, I think uh, that's where, yes, training is needed. And it is also about um, constantly infusing the language of diversity and inclusion into our everyday conversations. I think the other piece that's really important here, you know, a lot of um, a lot of the research that's looked at what leads to effective diversity and inclusion efforts, especially around training, is that um, there's an element of perspective taking, right? And I think that's so important when it comes to uh, focusing on these, you know, on the smaller teams. Um, Oftentimes, you know, diversity is kind of perceived as we're seen as the diversity police coming in to tell people you're biased, this is wrong, this is right. Um, and, and, you know, what I, what I always do is frame it as this is about storytelling. This is about all of us recognizing that there's more underneath the surface and that we as human beings often make judgments about each other based on what's above the surface. Again, it's human nature. So peeling that back and saying, as a team, the more that we understand what's beneath the surface with, you, with each other, the more trust we build, the more um, understanding we have about how when the other person ticks, um, what the, you know, what's driving their decisions and their, their frame of reference, and that makes us stronger as a team. So it's also thinking about diversity um, beyond just, again, a numbers game and, and considering it from this vantage point of, when I understand your perspective, even if I disagree with you, there's a value that comes from us being able to exchange those perspectives with, um, with you know, honoring one another's dignity, mm -hmm. right? And getting caught up in the, yes, but what you don't understand is X, Y, and Z. Um, when we feel heard, when we feel as though somebody values who we are, we're much more likely to listen. And I think that's the key, a, a critical element to trust building with teams. So yeah, absolutely. It's training. It's also, I think, um, really promoting this culture within the teams of valuing those divergent perspectives, encouraging them, um, bringing them forth and, and, um, and constantly sort of asking ourselves, how might I be turning my, my ears off to hearing what this other person has to say because I don't agree with it. You mentioned stories in a lot of your work, and, and you mentioned storytelling a, a little bit earlier now. Uh, a lot of the special operators that I know, to include the, uh, the university um, sergeant major, Sergeant Major Jeremy Lyle, he spends a lot of time studying like the value of storytelling as a, as a leadership tool. So could you talk to us a little bit about storytelling as a leadership tool and how it, and, you know, it impacts our discussion and, and possibly shaping identity and, and some of the other issues that we're discussing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, there's so much research that shows that tossing out a bunch of research at people doesn't make them change their attitudes, right? <laughs> That's kind of a, a little bit of a, um, a, you know, ironic twist there. But it's when we can tap into people at the emotional level, when I can connect with you um, and, and share some element of who I am, um, that is much more compelling to shape um, to reshape your belief system about me, uh, to break down some of your, uh, your walls around me and to break through some of those stereotypes that we might have of each other. So I think the power of storytelling from a leadership perspective is one, and, and stories, we as human beings are just, that's, we love stories, right? That's such a deeply embedded part of our civilization and the way that we communicate. Stories, um, 
not only tap into our emotions, but they also help us to um, you know, practice empathy and empathy in a few different ways, right? It's not only, okay, now I understand where you're coming from. Um, I, I see your perspective more clearly. Um, and it's not just now I can, I can see how you're feeling when you tell this story and the impact that this experience had on you. So I understand the, the depth to which this story or this experience has impacted you. But it's also, and I think this is such an important critical part um, to this work, it brings forth what we call empathic concern. And empathic concern is I care deeply about your wellness and well-being as a fellow human being. That is the humanizing factor of empathy that I think um, often gets lost in the conversation, but that's what storytelling gives us. It's not just, okay, I get you, but it's, I care about you in a way that I didn't five minutes ago before you told me that story. And I have seen it um, so many times in facilitating dialogues with people who are coming from vastly different vantage points who are, you know, at, at ideological war with each other. And when we sit down and they share their stories and they hear where the other person is coming from, from that personal vantage point, and they name the feeling that that person is sharing, that's when you see this moment of clarity. They're like, I'm not going to change my mind based on what you said, but you've given me a lot to think about and I, I care about you and I want what's best mm -hmm. for you. That's, that's fantastic. It reminds me of uh, being a, a young captain working with Afghans, and this was fairly early in the in the war, and we didn't have any idea it was going to go on this long. But having those conversations, and when I would talk about having a son, and at the time that I left, my kid was about three weeks old, so I didn't really know a whole lot about him. But when I would have those conversations with other Afghans, despite all of the differences, right, and and you can imagine the the differences are are, are, are really really pervasive at that point of having that conversation, you know, on a mountaintop in Afghanistan, that really took away all of the walls. And it was just, you know, a group of guys sitting around talking about the idea of being a father and how that resonated with everybody. And I think it really allowed us to see each other as, you know, fellow human beings, which opens up the gate for all of the other emotions and things to, to help build some connection. So I like the I idea that stories are there. And, and, yeah, yeah because, you know, it gives us common ground but it doesn't minimize the differences. It actually gives us a path to be able to explore those differences with respect, right? With dignity. So I think that's a really, that's, that's such a great example. And I think it's great, you know, if we can enter into these kind of complex environments with the idea that I'm dealing with people, right? Mm -hmm. And that people are different, but people also have certain similarities, right? And, and, and I can find them. Like, I'm gonna go look for the ways that we're similar instead of trying to find the ways that we're different. That, and that might shape everything. So in, in looking at a lot of your work, um, you talk a lot about overcoming perceptions and stereotypes in uh, this process of emotional ownership. Yeah. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Because I think that might be the key to really helping the, the, the profession learn about, you know, partner force leadership a little bit. Yeah, this is, uh, this is really, I think, so fascinating because, you know, there's obviously a lot that's been discussed in terms of leadership and emotional intelligence in the last couple of decades. And the way I define emotional ownership is um, there's, it's deeply connected to emo emotional intelligence. And I think it's kind of one step um, further. So for me, emotional ownership is um, I often talk about uh, bridging these differences, right? We have to be willing to walk out on the bridge um, even when we don't necessarily know that someone's going to meet us halfway on that bridge, right? I'm over here with my perspective, with my lens, with my mental model, you're over there, maybe with a completely oppositional way of looking at the world. Um, and we can both stay in our comfortable little environments and, you know, just with people who reinforce our beliefs of the truth, or we can take the, take the plunge, right? And walk out on that bridge. Um, in order to walk out on the bridge, I can't leave my emotions behind. Um, as much as we were talking about this work being pragmatic, there is an emotional element. I have to bring my heart with me, right? I have to be willing to name uh, the emotions that come with my stories because our stories are often deeply connected to emotions, right? My story of my identity is one of 
pride and pain and sorrow and happiness, right? It's all of these things mixed up. And that's the same with the person who's walking out, you know, on that other end of the bridge. So I have to be willing to share my emotions without them kind of taking over the conversation and I have to create space for others to do the same. Um, so I, I can give you an example, and I know you and I talked about this yesterday. Um, my, my, uh, I have two young daughters, and uh, the school that they go to has a peace program. Um, and it's incredible because from the age of four years old, they're learning about emotional intelligence and how the brain works. And they're learning mindfulness practices and conflict re you know, resolution strategies. And it warms my heart, but it also, they totally use it against me sometimes. And so there have been multiple occasions, but on this one occasion, um, my youngest daughter and I got in an argument because she was refusing to eat. And I was getting more and more frustrated with her and she was getting more and more you know, set in her um, desire to not do what I wanted her to do. And I finally sort of just exploded and I was like, just eat your food, you know? Um, and my older daughter who was six at the time said, mommy, I think you're having an amygdala hijacking. Um, your emotions have taken over and you need to find a way to de-escalate the situation. And I just wanted to, you know, yell, but then I just started laughing. I was like, you're right. I totally am having an amygdala hijacking. So walk me through, what should I do? And she said, well, why don't you share how you're feeling? And why don't you ask Lily how she's feeling? And so I did, I was like, I'm feeling frustrated. You know, how are you feeling? And she said, well, I feel like this isn't fair because you didn't ask me what I wanted for dinner. And it was, it's a silly example, but I think it's a beautiful moment of how we can find connection when we are willing, but it does take intentionality, right? I gotta bring the heat down a little bit inside myself and be willing to hear the perspective of someone else. Um, the other reason that I like this particular example is that there's a power element to that, right? I'm the adult. And really what was at the crux of this is my kid wanted autonomy to pick her own dinner. And I was missing that, right? And I think a lot of times um, considering the, the, the work that you all do in special operations, when you are engaging with people in these tribal communities, for example, there's a power differential there. There's a perceived power differential, right? And so how am I being perceived by others? And what am I bringing in in terms of my own, um, my own sort of internalized thoughts about who has power in the situation, right? Because the more power I have, the less empathy I might have, the less perspective I'm taking of somebody else um, who's not in that power position. And again, that's just kind of natural. That's how our brains function. We just, when, when it's not something that is causing us to feel pain or to feel powerless, we're sort of blind to it. Um, and we have to create that space for someone else to share that with us and to acknowledge it in order to make progress. So I hope that's helpful, but... Um, it's, it's very helpful. <laughs> One, I like that you're able to use, like as we're having this conversation about storytelling, you're like, let me show you what this looks like because we're gonna use the story to understand, right? And no matter what culture, no matter what background you have, everybody understands the, the leadership challenges of being a parent. <laughs> yeah. So you, you either, you, you know, you've had one or you've seen other people do it or you've experienced it. So it helps everybody go. Yeah. <laughs> How do I respond to situations like that where the, the harder you try, kind of the worse, worse it goes. I, I had one day where I had a similar thing with my kid and it ended up being this giant standoff. Um, and I think a lot of it was because I was I had it in my mind that the only way to overcome this was to, to outwill him. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and to this day, I'm pretty sure I lost that, lost that thing. He, you know, he ended up eating at some point along the way he had to, because it was a long time ago, but uh, <laughs> it's good to understand and learn about more tools so that you can overcome these things faster and get back to more positive experiences. So with that, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, your bridge idea and mm -hmm. something we hit on before, and it goes a little bit about safety, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone has a certain need for safety, um, whether they like to think about it or not. And so I think the idea of safety, when we're talking about trust and we're also talking about fear, those two ideas and you know power differentials, right? So all three of those ideas really kind of allude to the, the idea that people want to feel safe in their, in their pursuit of these things. 
Um, and it makes me think too about people can enter with different frames on, am I going to enter into this thinking about what I can gain or am I going to enter into this thinking about what I can lose? And I think you have some ideas about how thinking about what you have to gain versus what you have to lose might help you overcome some of the fear, particularly in the topic we're talking about today. So I'll stop talking now. Yeah, I love that. Um, so let me see if uh, this kind of gets to it. I, I think oftentimes, and again, we're just sort of this part of our hardwiring is to see this as a zero sum game, right? And the, it's a win or loss situation. And so I think it starts with um, shifting our mindset to this yes and thinking, right? That it is about embracing multiple perspectives and realities and about seeking outcomes that are going to be in the best interest for everyone. Um, but that it's hard because it means that I have to sort of override that immediate instinctual reaction of mm -hmm. I'm right, you're wrong, right? Um, and we've seen this play out in, um, you know, even there, uh, <laughs> we can see it play out all the time on our Facebook feeds, right? Um, <laughs> And just like the ideological drama that's happening all around us. But um, we lose our ability to engage in critical thinking then, right? Because all we're doing is trying to win the battle of the wills um, and we turn ourselves off from exploring any sort of um, points that might be different from what we have. Um, and I think that's, that has increasingly gotten worse um, because of a lot of, you know, because of technology, because of our, you know, physical distance and isolation, as well as the fact that, you know, um, people tend to migrate into communities of folks who are more like that, right? So we're just kind of, we've got our little pockets everywhere and we surround ourselves with people who share the same viewpoints that we do. And then we reinforce that with each other. So it takes a lot of courage to step out of that and say, I'm going to leave the safety of my own little nest of people who think like me, um, not, and not only say I'll explore, you know, because I think what happens a lot of times is not only do we see folks who don't share our perspectives as wrong, but we also start to place some judgments on them that you're, you're more ignorant than people who are like me. You are less moral than people who are like me. And this, this shows up in, you know, again, in the research that we tend to increasingly dehumanize folks. And so um, it means that I have to say, what can I value and appreciate about your perspective? I'm not going to necessarily agree with you, but what can I hear about your perspective that has meaning for me? Um, and when we do that, we actually all win, right? Because we're making the people on the other end who are sharing their story um, be a little bit more willing to hear our perspective. So I don't know if that answers your question, Dr. Ron. It, it, it did, and it, and it took it even to another level, which I think is great. And if there's not a better argument for for kind of the false sense that homogeny is a, is a source of strength. You know, it's really diversity or, and, and all of these other things. But, and, I, and I'm really glad you brought up Facebook and someone from the audience is, is, is gonna be happy too, because I wanna lead to one of the first um, audience questions. And I think this is absolutely spot on for, for the sign of the times. So I'll read it for, verbatim. Are you concerned that today's current climate characterized by a strong cancel culture will stifle conversations wherein we might learn more about one another. Asked another way, how important is it that people are encouraged to talk to one another without fear of being labeled racist, sexist, or other negative biases? Yeah, oh, that's, um, that's such a good question. I, I see, and I think a lot of diversity professionals see this notion of cancel culture as really problematic, right? Because we are closing off the doors for thoughtful conversations to take place. Um, and I think that there's, you know, it's, it's finding a way to create some sense of balance. And that's not necessarily always right in the middle, but we do need to hold people accountable for um, sharing or perpetuating messages that are oppressive or are um, uh, destructive, especially for groups who have been, you know, historically marginalized and oppressed, right? So um, there's a great quote by James Baldwin who says, we can disagree and still love each other unless our disagreement is writ written in um, 
your denial of my humanity and right to exist, right? So I do think that we have to hold people accountable for, um, for putting out there messages that are destructive to the conversation. Um, when, and we also have to provide some grace, right? We also have to give some space for people to mess up. Um, if anything has, you know, really, I think, shown up for me in the last year, um, in the wake of last summer and, you know, the, um, the murder of George Floyd, that um, leaders were, many leaders were really anxious and even some terrified to say anything because they were worried that if I say something and it's wrong, it's going to lead to more, um, you know, more negative results. And so I'm just going to stay silent. Um, and I think that's really problematic, right? Because silence only perpetuates the, the challenge. So we have to give people some space to, to say something, to ask questions, to make mistakes and learn from them. Um, and we have to hold folks accountable if they are engaging in behaviors and not willing to learn. Um, so I think in terms of whether that's showing up on Facebook, and I will be the first to admit that I have made some snarky comments on Facebook <laughs> based on my own political beliefs and ideologies, um, but I've really tried to be intentional about engaging when people share a perspective that's very different than mine, responding with, can you help me understand where you're coming from? And sometimes they engage and sometimes they don't, but I find that that leads to much better conversations mm -hmm. and connections than let me tell you why you're wrong. Um, so, you know, as much as I sometimes want to do that, but um, I do think that that's going to be a significant um, challenge for us moving forward. If we're to make progress in diversity and inclusion, then we have to create that space for people to, um, to come together and be messy because this is not, it's not easy. And all of us, regardless of who we are and where we come from, are going to get it wrong. I've definitely made the same mistake before of starting conversations with, let me tell you why you're wrong. Um, and, and it's definitely one of those things that as you say it, you kind of think back and you're like trying to stop it as it's happening. So we have a, another question here and I, and I think it's a, a very interesting one. Um, so one of the challenges of working in the DNI space in the soft community is discussing the power of emotions. We've talked a little bit about that. Um, this is contradictory to the work that operators do. They are hardwired and focused to defeat the enemy, to bring them down to an emotional mindset change is a tough sell. Most DNI conferences often share this. And although I understand this works well in the civilian world, what best practices can you share for the soft operator? This kind of ties everything in and it's a lot, but I think you can handle it. Um, well, I'll give, I'll give my answer and then I would actually love to hear your answer too, Dr. Long, because I think that that's one of the biggest questions that I have um, in doing this work uh, with, um, with, you know, the Department of Defense, with um, the intelligence community, when so much of um, your, you know, the training and conditioning and success is really reliant upon, you know, having an enemy, right? And, and to a certain extent, dehumanizing that enemy in order to um, engage in the activities that you have to engage in, right? I think that that's a really cha big challenge, a complex challenge. I think that, um, you know, going back to what we were talking about earlier around sort of um, retooling our, you know, our neuro pathways, I think it's about breaking down some of that conditioning, not erasing it, but saying, consider the situation. And again, from a pragmatic perspective, how do I humanize this individual and perhaps still maintain a more global idea of the group as the enemy, right? Um, so I don't know if that is the way to go, but I see that as maybe one potential that, you know, we, we're, um, if I can, if I can break it down to my individual interactions with this other person and see their humanity. Um, and then again, from that pragmatic viewpoint, uh, how do I ensure that I am um, creating the best mechanism for communication so that I'm gathering information that I need to make better strategic decisions, whether that's um, with the folks on my team or in my interactions with our foreign counterparts. So um, I think that's, yeah, that's, I, I would have some curiosity, you know, from your perspective, Dr. Long being in the field. 
So I'll take I'll take a stab at it. And your answer was uh, was certainly spot on. So I'll go back to what we talked about with fear, right? And and you're right that this is you know this is strategic. When we're having these relationships in these developing countries, it has a very strategic effect. So it's important that we get it right. Um, so if we're talking about diversity and inclusion as a vehicle to help us overcome fear of other people, then that's a good thing because what that does is it helps us not see more enemies, right? Here, so here's my fear that if I'm afraid of everybody who doesn't look like me, now suddenly instead of having one enemy, I have 10, 20, right? So if I if I allow fear to drive my thinking, I'm going to create enemies, whereas I should be trying to limit enemies, right? I should be trying to I should be trying to get rid of as many enemies as possible so I can focus on the ones that are the most prominent, right? The ones that are the that are biggest strategic threat. And so understanding that now I think it's like, hey, I'm offering you a great tool to reduce to reduce the impact of who you think are your enemies so you can find the ones that are really there. And you're right. I mean, I think there's a natural human tendency when we're talking about human nature before for us to think that we have to have some sort of monster to destroy. And because of that, we might spend a lot of time so like creating monsters just so we can destroy them to feel like we're doing that. And I think that that's counterintuitive and I think that it's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So by using diversity and conclusion to overcome fear, we can reduce our perception that everyone's an enemy and then we can see the enemy for what it is and then actually focus our efforts on that. And then my final addition to that is in that lens of, of leading partner forces in these highly complex environments, we're not alone, right? So the ability to build relationships means that instead of, you know, so simultaneously while we're reducing the enemy, we're also building our partner force, right? So we're increasing the degree that we're not alone. So that's just win, win, win all the way around. I hope that answered uh, your question or, or met some of your expectations. Yeah, absolutely. That's really helpful. All right. So I think we're at the end of our time here. I want to thank you very much for coming out. I appreciate it. Um, getting to learn about all of the great work that you're doing. And for our listeners out there, feel free to, to look Maria up. She has all sorts of fascinating work out there. Uh, if you haven't seen her TEDx talk, it, it really does a great job of like honing in on all the topics we're talking about there. And some of her writing is, is really, really fantastic. So thank you very much for coming out and taking your time to make us better. And I'm sure most of our listeners will agree that you've done exactly that. You've given us a lot to think about and a lot to digest. And I think moving forward, we're going to have a much better sense of what diversity and inclusion means. And moving forward to think of it as another tool that we can use to make us better as opposed to something to incite fear. So thank you very much. Thank and you. I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thanks so much.